welcome everyone to the inaugural, the first family engagement learning series. Uh, this opening learning series webinar is focused on math and literacy to support um, student success. We are super excited to have all of you here. I see the room filling up. And as that happens, I just want to give a couple of housekeeping notes. First and foremost, I am Cecily Darden, Special Assistant uh, for Family Outreach here at the United States Department of Education. We're um, excited to be here and in partnership with um, two organizations, the Carnegie Corporation of New York and the Overdeck Family Foundation. Uh, you will hear from uh, the leaders of both of those organizations in just a few minutes. Um, in the interim, what we want to share with you is that we are um, do not have a a chat enable. Um, the chat is um, the chat is is available, however, for you to chat panelists and the hosts. So what we want to do, is encourage you to uh, to chat the panelists and hosts so that we know who's here. So please drop it in so that we can know um, what areas of the country are represented um, and what organizations are represented, what states and local districts, and if we have any parents in the in the the Zoom, we want to know that as well. Uh, the other piece that I want to make sure to highlight for us is that we are um, we are not, while we are not having the chat, we have the Q&A section open and alive. And this is really important for us because the last 15 minutes of this webinar are going to be an open Q&A with the panelists. So we encourage you as you, um, as questions arise for you, uh, and and during the, the panel discussion to enter your, your questions so that we can share those questions with the panelists during the Q&A. Okay, what we are doing next is moving us into, I apologize, I'm looking at, um, there we go. We're gonna move us into um, a little bit about the webinar. I have a behind the scenes guru who is helping us share slides here. So Taylor, if you can share the slide deck, I appreciate it. And we, what we're talking about here is really what this webinar is about. The family engagement learning series. Thank you. Um, the Family Engagement Learning Series is about family engagement to support student success. Um, that the, the learning series uh, will cover several topics. This is the first of six sessions. We will be meeting on the fourth Tuesday of every month. And really the intent of this is to be able to increase um, awareness about the research and strategies on these key areas. As we talked about, this first one is going to be about math and literacy. Upcoming ones will be on attendance to student engagement, student in school safety, um, student mental health and well being, and uh, readiness for kindergarten, as well as college and career readiness. What we, um, skip this slide. the purpose of this, uh, this webinar series is really to bring together education leaders to implement family engagement strategies to help improve student success in their communities, their state, their local places. We wanna lift up research, we wanna lift up bright spots and share information and resources. You will get several links um, shared with you today through the chat as, as our presenters are speaking and you will receive resources uh, in the follow-up emails after this. What you'll hear throughout is a focus on um, making sure that we are inclusive around diversity as well as, um, as well as tools and technology. We're gonna have welcomes from three, our three organization leaders, um, one from Secretary Miguel Cardona, 
of the Department of Education, from Dame Louise Richardson, president of Carnegie Corporation of New York, and from Laura Overdeck, president of the Overdeck Family Foundation. So first up is going to be a, um, a, video, um, a video welcome from our Secretary of Education. He is our 12th Secretary of Education and has really put this focus on partnership um, to achieve equity and excellence in education throughout his career. Uh, what we want to focus on is that he is leading the nation's 65 million students from pre-kindergarten to adult learners and their families. And while he started in Connecticut, he is really serving the, the children, uh, educators, and families across this country. So here's a welcome from Secretary Cardone. Thank you, Cecily, for the introduction. And a special thank you to our partners at the Carnegie Corporation of New York and the Overdeck Family Foundation. You are no strangers to this work. Communities are deepening family engagement because of your partnership. To so all the leaders, the practitioners and advocates joining, I'm thrilled to help kick off this family engagement learning series. The voices of parents and families in education are vital, now more than ever. Today we'll talk about how engaging families can support students' success, particularly in math and literacy. In upcoming sessions, we'll learn from each other about ways to use the American Rescue Plan dollars to advance this important work. We'll hear about promising practices and look at approaches that strengthen home and school partnerships. I'm excited about this work and I'm encouraged by all of you who are committing to evidence-based and sustainable family engagement strategies. Look, when we intentionally partner with parents and families, we raise the bar for our students. Research backs us up. Students with involved parents are more likely to show up to school and stay motivated in the classroom. This can increase achievement, on-time graduation rates, and set students on a path of lifetime success. While I come to you as a Secretary of Education, I'm a parent first. That's the title, Poppy is the title I love most. So I know there's no one more attuned to the ways their children learn best, no one more determined to see them succeed than parents. I've traveled to more than 40 states as Secretary of Education, and I've engaged with nearly 9,000 parents from Oklahoma to New York, and I've heard parents saying, we need more. We need more communication, we need more resources, more opportunities to engage. We need not just to be told our voices matter. We need our voices to actually matter. We need a seat at the table. That's why conversations like this one are so important. In just a few moments, you'll hear about proven strategies to boost math and literacy achievement in diverse communities across the country. Strategies that involve and empower, not just inform parents. From my experience as a parent and educator, I know the foundation of any successful effort in education is built on trust, built on shared goals, and it's built on open communication. That's one reason why the department came out with a parent checklist last year. Parents should feel comfortable walking into their kid's school and asking tough questions about how their kids are supported to be successful. They should be equal partners in ensuring their kids' social, emotional, and academic needs are met. I'm encouraging everyone to check out the parent checklist on our website. Go to ed.gov, scroll down a little bit, you'll see it. Print it out, share it with your friends, share it on social. Get it out there. It's a practical tool for families. It's only one tool in our toolkit though. Along with statewide family engagement centers, we have many resources to support families and support parents in this shared work of educating our children. We also support nearly 100 parent training and information centers, as well as community parent resource centers. These centers help parents of children with disabilities to participate effectively in their children's education. I know we have a full agenda, so I'll wrap up in the way I began as a dad. I feel hope when my children learn something new. I despair when they're struggling. I feel excited when they embark on a new chapter. My son just started college. Look, my point is this. Parents know their children, their hopes, and their dreams. Let's push for all parents to have more access 
more engagement in their children's learning. Let's make sure we're listening and responding to the voices of our diverse families, including our multilingual families. Let's recognize the rich value that parents bring to our classroom communities as we enlist them as full partners in decisions that affect their kids. With family support, there's no limit to what our children can achieve. With family support, we'll raise the bar in education. Now I'd like to hand it over to one of our partners, Dame Louise Richardson, president of Carnegie Corporation of New York, a philanthropic foundation committed to advancing democracy, education, and international peace. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to Secretary Cardona, the US Department of Education, and the Overdeck Foundation for joining the corporation in co-hosting this timely and important learning series on family engagement. Family engagement, the concept of schools partnering with families to help them support their children's education and development is not new, but the pandemic brought its importance front and center. And as Secretary Cardona has said, every parent who has engaged with their children's school appreciate its importance. Research commissioned by Carnegie Corporation of New York shows a significant association between family engagement and the academic achievement of urban elementary and middle school students. Family engagement has also been shown to reduce dropout rates. You'll be hearing more about these findings in a few minutes. Findings like these explain why the corporation's education program has spent the past seven years focused on bringing together families, communities, students, educators, policymakers, and the public in support of an equitable and high quality educational system. We fund programs that bridge the gap between home and school because we believe that when families are empowered as true partners in their children's education, students thrive schools are stronger, and the whole community benefits. We know this work is difficult. We know just how hard committed educators at federal, state, and local level have sought to create and sustain effective family engagement strategies. Our hope is that this learning series will explore the dynamics and challenges that stand in the way of effective family school partnerships. We want to highlight ways that educators and system leaders can build equitable family engagement practices throughout the American educational system. We are very grateful to our collaborators in this endeavor, among them, the Overdeck Family Foundation. Laura Overdeck, along with her husband, John, founded the foundation to support life, the life-changing power of education. Laura joins us now to tell us more about their work. Over to you, Laura. Thank you so much, Louise, for that very warm introduction. Um, it is a really great honor to be here today and with these incredible partners talking about um, one of the most underutilized levers we have in children's academic success, and that is family engagement. As the founder of Bedtime Math and chair of the Overdeck Family Foundation, I have seen firsthand um, how families can play a crucial role and how much this power is overlooked. Um, as we struggle to find teachers in this teacher shortage or tutors, as we struggle to find enough adults, we realize that the person who is most available and ready and invested to help is the person caring for that child. And so if we can, um, when we support and engage caregivers, that really ignites children's success. And the research proves this. It makes sense. But in fact, um, scientific research has shown that when schools engage families, the children succeed not just in school, but in real life. Um, it's everything from higher grades and test scores, better attendance, fewer special education designations, more positive attitudes and behaviors that carry them for years, and of course, higher graduation rates and greater um, enrollment in higher education. So what's also interesting is any caregiver can have this impact. They have found that just having the caregiver involved has twice the impact as whether or not that caregiver has a strong education background 
or their socioeconomic status. It, there's nothing really magical here. We can really enable any caregiver to have this impact on their children. So for these reasons, investing in that, um, in programs that help families engage is a really crucial step in accelerating children's achievement, especially given the shortfalls that we have from COVID. Um, I am honored that Overdeck Family Foundation is a leading partner in this work, um, and I'm excited to help kick off this learning series, which will find and spotlight evidence-based resources um, that promote student success. And so with that, I'm excited to introduce, introduce Dr. Karen Mapp. She's a senior lecturer on education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, over the past 20 years, Dr. Mapp's research and practice focus has been on the cultivation of partnerships among families, community members, and educators that support student achievement and school improvement. She is a founding member of the District Leaders Network on Family and Community Engagement, as well as the National Family and Community Engagement Working Group. She's also a trustee of the Hyams Foundation in Boston and is also on the boards of the National Association for Family, School, and Community Engagement and the Institute for Educational Leadership. So with that, Karen, it is an honor to have you here today, and I hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Laura. I really appreciate um, that introduction. And so in a very quick 10 minutes, I am going to try to give you all an overview on just how important this engagement of families actually is in terms of our student success. But I'm also going to share with you some quick findings on the research about how this engagement not only helps our students, but helps all of us in this work. And so I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully the technology is gonna work because we all know how that goes. So hopefully you can all see my screen. And so what I wanna do is talk to you about um, a new uh, bit of research that's come out from my collaborators, uh, Ann Henderson, who many of you know, has been doing this work for many, many years. And she and I partnered on this in terms of trying to share the research with you on the power of engaging our families. And so the, the title of my quick 10 minutes is when we partner, everyone wins. And we are fortunate enough to have published a brand new book. It came out uh, this past year, 2022, which really is the fifth installment in the evidence series. Some of you may remember uh, a new wave of evidence, and this is, um, a, a book that Ann and I authored with the support, actually, of the USDOE through the CEDO, uh, found to the, the, to, through the folks at CEDO, excuse me. And uh, we were able to publish a book that was for practitioners and for researchers and others that summarize the research on family engagement. And that was research that was done before 2002. So what we knew is that it's been 20 years, if we can't believe it, it's been 20 years since that publication. And we thought it would be really wise to do another publication where we summarize what research had been done over the past 20 years to again show us the impact of engagement on outcomes. So we were able to select 40 studies and the studies span right up to 2021. So what did we find out? Two big headlines from this research. And what we found was that first of all, we know for sure after over 50 years of research that when we engage our families in partnership, these full, equal and equitable partnerships between home and school, we not only see benefits for our students, we see benefits for our educators, for our families, for our schools and our districts and communities. And we also learned, and this is sort of what was what else was new from this research. This re research told us a lot about what are the high impact strategies when we're trying to partner with our families. And this research actually very much supports the two dual capacity building frameworks, version one, which many of you may remember, I was very honored to be in partnership with the US Department of Education and we were able to, in collaboration again with CEDO, publish the first dual capacity framework on family school partnerships. And right after this was published, I actually started to ask people out in the field who were using it, 
what works, what doesn't work, what would you like to add? And that was when I was able to uh, revise the framework and come up with a new one, which is version two of the dual capacity framework for family school partnerships. But what I am really excited about is that the research on the impact of partnerships actually feeds this uh, dual capacity framework and is the foundation on which the framework is built. It's a research-based framework. So what we're gonna be talking about today are these conditions. So what you're gonna be hearing from our panelists who will be coming up is that they're gonna be talking about what exactly do we need to know how to do in order to support this work? But let's talk quickly about the outcomes. And so what we know is that when we partner, these are the outcomes that we see for our family. So many of you who know me, who know that I do a lot of these presentations, I always talk about uh, that famous commercial, where's the beef, right? Where Clara Peller wanted to know, what do we see if I'm going to spend my hard-earned resources on your product, what am I going to see as a return on investment? So this is the where's the be for our students, higher grades and test scores, better attendance. I'm not going to read through all of them because we don't have time for that today. But I did want to highlight a couple of studies since this is our first in the series about the impact of engagement. We're talking about math today. I did want to highlight a couple of the studies that are in Everyone's Wins, which really pinpoint the effect of engagement on math. So this was the study that was done. With the lead author is Francis Van Voris. They did a meta-analysis, which is basically a summary looking at a lot of the literature and a lot of the research on family engagement. And what they found was that parents from all backgrounds with support are interested in and able to conduct learning activities at home with their children. And in math, they particularly saw that when families took part in targeted workshops, so these goal link to learning workshops around math, when they engaged in those activities with their children and used math games to build their children's essential math skills, we saw improvement in math. Second study by Steve Sheldon and Sobe Young, student outcomes and parent teacher home visits. What they found was that as the result of parent-teacher home visits as designed with fidelity, done with fidelity, they also saw increased improvement in math. So those are specific studies that really look at this engagement, this partnership on math. But just quickly, I want to let you know that we now know that this engagement isn't just good for our students, it's good for our educators. We find that when our educators engage with families, a lot of the deficit-based mindsets they have about families begin to melt away. They start to really appreciate multicultural awareness and know how to do those strategies and practices. Stronger morale. What else do we see? We see wins for our families now. So we see that our families are able to have stronger relationships with their children because they know more, because we're exchanging information with our families they know more about how to support their children's learning. So these are some of the ways in which we see the impact of engagement on our families. Wins for schools, more positive school climates, higher morale. You know, a lot of our teachers like being in schools that have strong family engagement. And then also these schools have better reputations in the community when they're engaged with families. And then wins for our districts and our communities. You can see, again, lots of very powerful outcomes, reduced suspensions, increased graduation rates. And so I just want to emphasize that this engagement is a key ingredient to the success of our students. And so what I'd like to do now is to quickly turn this over, I believe, back to, uh, to Sicily. Thank you so much, Dr. Matt, for that overview of the research and the evidence. We, um, we deeply appreciate you setting this frame around what we know around effective family engagement for, uh, for the support of math and literacy. Um, thank you, 
thank you, Taylor, for getting us to this introduction of our panelists. This is the important next step where we have two conversations that we're going to engage in with panelists. Um, the first conversation is with Alejandro of Springboard Collaborative. He's their, pres their CEO and founder and their partner, Carlin Powell of LA, um, the Los Angeles Unified School District. Um, and Carlin is the administrator for elementary um, instruction there. Our second conversation that we're going to go right into after that is one with the co-founders of the Family Engagement Lab, um, Vidya um, Sundaram and Elizabeth O'Brien. They're going to uh, be in conversation with Willis Smith, who is uh, in DeSoto Parish in Louisiana and is a coordinator for student learning, um, K-12, ELA, and advanced studies in summer schools. A lot of responsibilities in a relatively small district. I think that's what it looks like for us. Um, and then we will have a conversation that brings us together with the principal, Brandon Pinkney. So, Thank you very much. Um, and right now I'm going to turn this over to Alejandro. If you can please come on and start this next part of the conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, and just a quick logistical thing, Carlin joined, uh, but she didn't use the panelist link. So if somebody can move her over, um, that would be fantastic. Uh, she uh, stepped out of a board meeting uh, in order to, uh, to share with us. So I'm sure all the district leaders in attendance can can uh, empathize there. Um, and also, if we can pull up the slide. I so appreciate that. And we're, we're, we're doing that on this end. Do you see her, Taylor? Fantastic. Um, this, this is one of those things that when we have district <laughs> partners, we know what it looks like to be in um, schools and in districts. Great. Um, but I'll kick us off. I'll get us started. Um, and if you're awesome. able to pull up the slides, you're, you're way ahead of me. Uh, my name is Alejandro. I'm the CEO and founder of Springboard Collaborative. Really appreciative to be here with you all today. Uh, I also appreciated that Secretary Cardona started with his family. I'm going to do the same. Uh, so if we move to the next slide, uh, I'll share a bit about uh, where Springboard came from uh, and why we care so much about family engagement. Those are my parents on the left, uh, and that's me on my mom's lap. Like so many immigrants, my parents came to the U.S. so their kids could have better educational opportunities. Uh, but it, it didn't take long for us in Carrollton, Georgia, to realize that schools serving poor families like ours don't often enough live up to America's promise. So my family re-strategized. We rented the cheapest house in an affluent community in New Jersey with a highly rated public school. And my parents figured that's going to be the ticket. But it wasn't. It, it didn't work either. Uh, my sister and I excelled in spite of the school system, not because of it. Most of my teachers treated my parents like pushy immigrants who didn't belong in the school system. My classmates treated me the same way. The high school guidance counselor even tried to talk me out of applying to Harvard to avoid the disappointment of rejection, even though I was the valedictorian. Later that year, she seemed disappointed to read my acceptance letter. If it weren't for my parents' tireless advocacy in the face of hurdle after hurdle after hurdle, my sister and I might have accepted the limitations others tried to impose on us. Our parents were the only adults in our lives who consistently believed in us, who saw the fullest version of our potential and helped us to realize it by setting and achieving one goal and the next. The school system never recognized the value in my family. They, they couldn't even see it. After graduating, I became a first grade teacher in a Puerto Rican neighborhood in North Philly. Uh, and those are my kids there on the right. In my students, I saw myself. And in their parents, I saw my own. My students' parents gazed at their kids with the same loving eyes with which my parents had gazed at me. Next slide, please. You'll see those are the same loving eyes with which my wife and I gaze at our one and a half year old daughter, Alma, the very same eyes with which you gaze at your kids for any of the parents in the room. As a teacher, I soon became frustrated that my school and our system can treat black and brown parents like mine and like me as liabilities rather than as assets. Too many of my colleagues talked about a kid's home life as a risk to be mitigated rather than a resource to be cultivated. 
I knew for my life that we were missing a, back, a massive opportunity. And to the point that Dr. Matt made, the research is really clear. Parental involvement in their children's learning is one of the most powerful predictors of academic success. As an education sector, we focus so much on school improvement, and that matters. But children only spend 13% of their waking hours inside classrooms. When it comes to educating kids, there's just no going around parents. Teachers have to work with them and through them to ensure students learn across the continuum of home and school. At Springboard, we believe that parents' love for their children is the single greatest, and to the point that Laura made, the most underutilized natural resource in education. Our job as an organization is to help school districts tap into this natural resource and unleash parents' teaching potential. Next slide, please. So I founded Springboard a decade ago to close the literacy gap by bridging the gap between home and school. And we do that by coaching families and educators to team up and help their kids learn to read by fourth grade. Springboard's recipe for impact is a method called Family Educator Learning Accelerators, or FILAs for short. FILAs are five to 10 week cycles during which families and teachers team up to help kids reach learning goals. And they've got these six really basic steps that, that I wanna run through. Step one is to build relational trust between teachers and families. Even a 20 minute virtual team building conversation is incredibly predictive of whether or not families engage throughout the cycle. Step two, families and educators need a shared understanding of students' learning baseline in order to set an ambitious but achievable growth goal in the next step. Otherwise, you end up with a situation in which nine in 10 parents in our country think their kid is performing on grade level, even though only one in four kids actually meet that standard. Step three, the goal, and this is the, the, the keystone that holds the whole thing together. Uh, that goal should be quantitative, for example, moving from one reading level to the next, and it should be achievable within five to 10 weeks. Uh, we've learned that fewer than five weeks isn't quite long enough to build a habit, and longer than 10 weeks puts the finish line so far away that, that it's hard to motivate behavior change. Step four, practice, practice, practice. Kids need to practice with their educators, whether it's in person or virtual, led by a classroom teacher or a tutor. Kids also need to practice with their families at home for at least 15 minutes per day. And Springboard developed an app that provides daily guidance to families so that even a parent who isn't themselves a reader can still be a confident reading tutor at home. Finally, the whole team has to practice together at least four times to share skills and create mutual accountability and teamwork. Step five, at the end of that five to 10 week stretch, you measure progress and see how kids did relative to their goal. And the very final step uh, is to celebrate in step six. Experiencing that quick win is what crystallizes lasting habits. And that's true both for educators for whom the light bulb goes off. Parents are the co-teachers that I never knew I had. They're, they're the tutors hiding in plain sight. And it's also true for parents who have the transformative experience of setting and achieving a goal with their child. Uh, for families that don't have that experience often enough, that can be really powerful and, and lead uh, to a virtuous cycle and an upward spiral. Those small wins lead to big wins down the road. Districts should implement FILAs three times a year, a five-week cycle during the summer to prevent regression, a 10-week cycle in the fall once teachers have identified who are the kids that most need a boost, and then a 10 week cycle in the spring to sprint through the finish of the school year. Next slide, please. So proof is in the pudding. When teachers and parents work together, student learning dramatically accelerates. Springboard partners with over 60 Title I school districts across, across the country, uh, supporting uh, over 25,000 struggling readers. Uh, our weekly family workshops average 88% attendance. For every hour that a teacher leads a workshop, parents deliver 25 hours of one-on-one -on -one support at home. And that's that's the secret sauce. That's what creates so much leverage on the teacher's time and effort, which is so critical when teacher capacity is really constrained. Uh, the way I see it, there's no more cost-effective or culturally responsive way to scale up tutoring than in partnership with families. Last year, Springboard participants averaged 2.3 to 9.5 months of reading growth across all essential early literacy skills in just five to 10 weeks. Uh, to put that growth into context, a study from McKinsey had estimated that marginalized kids ended the 2020-21 school year six months behind in reading. 
Last year, 60% of program participants ended uh, the school year reading on or above grade level, compared with just 24% meeting that standard nationally. Uh, moreover, families and teachers build long-lasting habits. Even six months after Afila ends, parents are still coaching their kids in reading for 19 more minutes per day than before the intervention. Uh, and 86% of families are still using the instructional strategies they picked up in the workshops. This is a huge amount of instructional time that would be difficult and frankly expensive to replicate through teachers or tutors. Only when parents and teachers work together can school communities unlock their true potential. Next slide, please. We'll take a look at LAUSD. So I'm joined today uh, by Carlin. Hopefully we've, we've been able to, to get her into the, the, uh, the room. Uh, we started this partnership uh, with LAUSD small with 500 kids in local district east, and we've grown quickly ever since. Last year, LAUSD renewed our partnership with a three-year agreement that could reach 20,000 learners, which we're so thrilled and grateful about. I'm gonna brag about LAUSD's outcomes before handing the mic to Carlin to share more about her experience and just more broadly how LAUSD thinks about the intersection of family engagement and elementary instruction, which is the, the work that she leads. During the last school year, across all grade levels, program participants in LAUSD averaged 4.2 months of growth in phonological awareness, phonological awareness, say that five times fast, 3.6 in decoding, and 3.8 in oral reading fluency in just eight weeks of programming. And 99% of their kids increased reading proficiency over the course of the program. On this slide, you'll see results from last summer, and those are broken out by grade level. Uh, bear with me, it's a little complicated, but the light blue bar shows students' reading levels going in to programming. Those vertical green lines show grade level expectations, so where, where we're hoping kids will be. And the dark blue bars show how much reading progress kids made during that five-week program. Third graders, for example, made 4.1 uh, months of reading growth last summer. As you can see, we closed the gap to grade level expectations by anywhere from a third to more than half in just those five weeks. For kindergartners, for example, we closed the gap to grade level by 57%. As a former first grade teacher, that makes my heart beat out of my chest. I, I've been talking way too much, uh, so I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna hand it to Carlin uh, if she's here, and uh, I'd love if you can share a little bit about your experience and just how you think uh, about family engagement at LAUSD. Oh, thanks, Alejandro. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Carlin Powell, and I am the administrator of elementary instruction um, in LAUSD's office of the chief, chief academic officer that we call the division of instruction. So um, I get to um, support, um, you know, content, professional development and initiatives um, at the elementary level, um, springboard being um, one of them, um, one that we're really, you know, excited about. Um, you know, the partnership and the implementation and, of course, the data, um, as Alejandro has been showing you. Um, so our district, um, we are really uh, moving in terms of literacy um, to the science of reading, um, to evidence-based practices that support um, literacy. We have an initiative called Primary Promise, um, which um, looks to um, get our students um, to proficiency to close that gap, you know, by third grade. And um, our springboard partnership, we have implemented through that initiative because it aligns so well with um, springboard. Uh, we focus on kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third graders in the area of literacy. Um, Alejandro talked about the wonderful data. I'll talk about, um, you know, parent engagement. So, you know, we know um, that, you know, it takes a village, right? It takes that partnership and collaboration uh, between home and school um, to really um, improve outcomes for our youngsters. And um, we thought we were doing a pretty good job in LAUSD with our family engagement and workshops until we started working with, with Springboard. And I only say that because they have kind of a little secret sauce here. Um, the family engagement 
um, is so tightly um, connected to what students are learning um, in the intervention and tutoring um, for that day in terms of the families coming into the classroom where the children are present. Um, they're learning a bite-sized strategy um, from the teacher um, in the classroom. They practice it together, parent, teachers, and students um, right there in the session. Um, and then that's probably why Alejandro was able to point to that transferable data of families um, continuing to use the strategies even beyond um, that springboard session. Um, what I've found um, over and over again is that, you know, every part of the springboard program from the curriculum to the workshops from families to the support um, that our teachers, our school site implementation teams get, um, you know, they just feel the impact and the value of the program. And, you know, I vis have the pleasure of visiting school sites um, for other reasons, for other, other of our initiatives. And when I hear principals and school teams talk about, well, this is what we want to do in literacy. We might be an early literacy block grant school. We want to bring the parent, the parent workshops like in Springboard. We want to do more of that. We want to transfer, you know, more of that process. We want to build on the, the curriculum that they provided or the workshop content because it's been so effective um, and, and useful for us. So we have a parent community services branch. Um, we usually um, collaborate with them um, a lot to produce, you know, webinars, you know, videos. We did a whole early literacy video series for our families. Um, last year, we have um, through the Primary Promise Initiative, literacy interventionists that we're doing workshops for families. But uh, what we've learned from Springboard is to like really be focused um, and to really, you know, have that bite-sized chunk, that strategy directly connected to the what the students are learning, um, and then to bring the families inside in the classroom with the students to practice. So we we plan to to borrow and scale up. Um, but in terms of you know our, our our time working with Springboard, um, we found that, you know, anything you do that's new, um, it's a lift. So, you know, in the first year, it was a lift for us. Um, and we were learning, you know, the program, there are, you know, different positions that support the program. There's a whole curriculum, um, you know, that um, Springboard has developed, um, teacher curriculum, also the family engagement pieces. But over and over, I had schools tell me, you know, we it took us a lot of work to get started, but we love it, right? Um, we have something called data dig meetings. So our most priority schools, they um, meet um, three, four times a year with our superintendent and they go over, you know, the growth in their literacy data or their math data over and over again. Um, principals were saying it was just last week. So it's on the top of my mind. They were saying, oh, well, I'm a springboard school or they were saying, oh, we have springboard launching. And, you know, we're really excited that, you know, we'll, we'll be doing our intervention for our K through three students. Um and we're talking about the data and the improvement and then just, um, you know, just really um, saying, speaking about the value of the program. So as Alejandro mentioned, we started small, small pilot in East, and they were able to, um, you know, reach out to us and bring, you know, the springboard program district wide. And we're pleased that year after year now, we have more and more schools. So I think we're at our biggest launch, um, you know, yet this year, and we just hope to do more and expand more. But really, um, when we look at um, the data uh, from students uh, pre and post springboard, we see all of that growth. And then there's the anecdotal um, information, the messages from families, the I get pictures from, you know, school site teams from their end of session celebrations and just thanks, you know, for the program. So uh, for us, we have a lot of learning from springboard that we're going to scale up, you know, in the district. Thank you so much for joining, Carlin, on such a busy day. Um, and I'll, Cecily, I'll hand it back to you because I, I know you're, you're running a, a tight you. ship on the schedule. <laughs> Thank you both, Alejandro and Carlin. It's always great to hear how not just within an organization, within a district, but within a school, um, family engagement is being implemented, especially in partnership with our educators and our school leaders, that, that you know, this is really about partnership between um, homes and schools and finding those 
uh, those those practices, those tools that can really support that happening as seamlessly as possible. So thank you so much for your your contributions and your conversation today. Uh, What we're going to do now is transition to our second conversation. I'm going to invite our our presenters from Family Engagement Lab, um, Vidya and Elizabeth, to come on camera, as well as uh, Willa from DeSoto Parish. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cecily. Um, And special thank you to Secretary Cardona, the U.S. Department of Education, Carnegie Corporation of New York, and Overdeck Family Foundations for all recognizing the power of family engagement and student learning. Uh, It's also a a special honor to share the space with Dr. Karen Mapp, whose work inspired me 20 years ago when I started my own career, uh, really focusing in on family's role in learning. And uh, it's incredible that she's provided all of us with a common language uh, for a global family of professionals to collaborate and innovate. And so really want to extend a thank you and thank you to all the panelists here. Um, Family Engagement Lab is a national nonprofit whose mission is to ignite the potential of millions of families to support uh, their child's learning. And our programs have supported more than 40,000 students across the country, three quarters of whom qualify for free or reduced price lunch, one third of parents who prefer communicating in a language other than English, and two thirds identify as a person of color. For the groups we serve, the pandemic has been devastating for student learning. And after the pandemic has forced so many students into remote at-home learning, parents' interest in partnering with schools to support their children has only increased. And when parents support learning at home, children are definitely more likely to succeed, as we've seen uh, many times and many uh, 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 pieces of evidence that really support this. Parents are especially interested in knowing what are my children expected to learn each year? And they wanna know if their child is on track academically. And most importantly, they wanna know how they can help. Parents are so ready to act, uh, yet parents from underserved student groups, such as English language learners, for example, report receiving less communication from their schools than their more affluent and English proficient peers, despite being just as committed to their child's academic success. So our solution, Fast Talk, or Families and Schools Talk helps schools and families to partner together to support learning goals. Through Fast Talk, families receive engaging weekly activities sent by text message in their home language from their teacher to support student learning across domains, including English language arts, math, and social and emotional learning. Equity is at the heart of our model, and so any caregiver with access to a cell phone can engage in their preferred language. There's no computer or internet connection required, and there's no app to download for families. Fast Talk's bilingual experts develop targeted content that is directly linked to the learning happening in the classroom, focused on those grade level skills and key developmental needs, while leveraging families' funds of knowledge to support student success. So I'll give you an example. So a parent of a third grader might receive a text message to make a map of their home as their child is learning at school how to calculate area. Or in middle school, there might be an ELA unit on immigration. And we've heard from parents appreciating the opportunity to connect their personal experiences with their child's learning. The magic of these activities is that they're designed to strengthen parent-child bonds while giving students more opportunities to practice what they're learning in the classroom. So it's possible you're wondering now, does my school community have the capacity to do this? Yes. Through Fast Talk, we make it possible for busy teachers and administrators who may not yet have the organizational capacities to link family engagement to learning. So we build and foster relationships across teaching and learning and family and community engagement while supporting teachers and work with your existing curriculum. We pre-schedule messages to save time for teachers while supporting strong parent-teacher relationships and collaborate with relationship building programs like home visit partnerships to sustain a focus on learning throughout the school year for every student. Most importantly, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're so honored to be featured here as an ev- evidence-based program. Here's the beef. I'm gonna hand it to Elizabeth to talk about Fast Talk's impact. Great, thanks so much, Vidya. I can go to the next slide, please. 
So we're really proud of Fast Talk's impact on student learning outcomes. In a study that was conducted in Oakland Unified, we had results that showed that four times more kindergarten students met literacy benchmarks with Fast Talk. And these kindergartners are not alone. We've seen positive academic outcomes for students whose families receive Fast Talk messages across elementary grades. And through our focus on equity and learning outcomes, we see that Fast Talk is achieving the biggest impact for children whose families do not share a language with their child's teacher and students who are furthest behind their peers academically. DeSoto Parish, a rural system in Louisiana, also saw results after using Fast Talk in conjunction with the rollout of a new curriculum. And we're pleased to have Willa Smith from DeSoto here with us today. And I'd love to ask Willa some questions. Yes, thank you for having up. me today. Wonderful. Well, we've had the pleasure of partnering with DeSoto since the 2019-2020 school year. And currently, students' families in pre-K through eighth grade are receiving weekly Fast Talk messages with information about what their children are learning in class and how to help at home. And a few months ago, I had the opportunity to visit a number of the schools we work with in DeSoto Parish. And it was so wonderful to meet students and teachers and school leaders to learn more about the school communities. And Willa, we'd love it. Can you share more about DeSoto Parish and a little bit about what the culture is like around family school partnership? Absolutely. So we're a small district in Northwest, Northwest Louisiana. We have about 10 schools and um, around 5,000 students. 100% of our students receive free and reduced lunch. And we have varying populations whenever it comes to special education, um, English language learners, and a low socioeconomic status situation. So economically disadvantaged students. We um, are a TAP district and we're currently um, the number six district in Louisiana with the previous year being um, number nine. We were conscientious and focused on community partnership, family partnership, but leading up into um, and going into the pandemic afterwards, we really felt that we could hone in and really support our families in a way that was deeper than, than prior years. Uh, the Louisiana Department of Education also um, started their Louisiana Comprehensive Literacy Plan. And so one of the four pillars there was uh, student and family engagement. And so we wanted to bring that community piece in. So our, our position is to serve our community, our family, and our students. And Fast Talk opened this opportunity to kind of dig further into this for DeSoto Parish. That's great. Wonderful. And I'm wondering if you could share now how Fast Talk sort of fits into your academic plan. Absolutely. So we started with you guys in 2019, 2020, and we were piloting um, in second grade with a new curriculum. And we were also doing um, grades three, eight with our guidebooks. So we started with this curriculum based messaging and we found that while students and parents and teachers needed this um, social emotional support after the pandemic, they were also needing a curriculum and content based support. So what we found with Fast Talk is where we had started this process leading up into the pandemic, it became uh, paramount that we were having this connection with parents in the home. And sometimes we looked at using um, different messaging systems. We had previously been using, of course, our SIS, and then we'd been using Google Classroom, but this gave us an opportunity to have content-based messaging go out to parents so parents could have these opportunities to have conversations in the home surrounding the content and the curriculum that students learned that day. So that was a really powerful piece where parents may not have had the tools or the resources to go beyond where um, they currently were. They were having questions that were formatted around the, the content in the English, um, the ELA units that they were studying in school. We now do this through grades uh, pre-K through eight, and it has been very successful with helping us to be content focused and to um, return to our pre-pandemic uh, success that we had and increase our, our scores and our student support and parent support across the district. Thanks, Will. I, I think you embedded to some of the pieces around like the impact Fast Talk has had on the community and some of those conversations that families are having at home. Are there other pieces you may want to add around um, the impact of Fast Talk that you've seen? Well, I think what was really powerful for us as a district is we were seeing parents and we're getting feedback from parents that were saying that they were having the opportunity for when the student got in the child, they could have focused um, questioning about what the student had done that day. And then they had that back and forth uh, messaging system for um, 
communicating with their parents where that may have been in place through emails or Google Classroom prior. This was a deeper level that we were able to communicate with parents and parents, teachers, students, so forth and so on. Another piece that we found was that we were able to reach all students. So um, really going into the pandemic, we noticed that, you know, not everyone has equitable access. So in some areas that we do not, we had students that did not have maybe uh, internet capacity or things of that nature. And this was a messaging system that all teachers um, could communicate through because 99% of the time we were having a parent with a phone or a messaging system of some sort. So that was something that was really beneficial to our community and gave us a way and a, um, a, an avenue to communicate with parents and students about the content that was being, being learned in those classrooms during that time. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Will. I have one, one last question for you. Um, what advice would you give to other rural schools who are looking for ways to engage families in learning? Absolutely. Well, I think what was really beneficial is that uh, Fast Talk provided us the opportunity to preview messages and allowed us to curate surveys that would enhance um, all stakeholders' uh, communication. So we, we heard from parents teachers, um, all stakeholders in the community about what they would like to hear in these messages. And I think that that is evidenced in our um, subscribe rate. So we have a fantastic subscribe rate and we make sure that we um, keep those contacts together. And that gives us a great opportunity to reach out to all, all students and parents and keep our, our focus where we want it to be, which is with the families and the communities and, and making us all one. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Willa. And uh, in addition to rural Louisiana school systems, Fast Talk is supporting diverse communities across the country, including LAUSD and Baltimore, to help connect that classroom learning with the at home learning. And I will turn things back to you, Cecily. Awesome. Thank you for that conversation, um, Vidya, Elizabeth, and Willa. I think that, you know, when we, we think about um, diversity. We, we don't always think about access um, in the same ways that we just heard you talk about. I loved hearing how, you know, how your community in DeSoto is really making sure to, to, make, that, to make sure that families all across whatever kind of access they have, you know, it's not just computer access, but they have a device that they can message on, and then they have a tool that allows them to fully engage um, into a communication with school and strengthen relationships with their with their young people at home. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you for um, for joining this call. While uh, Elizabeth did kind of hint at our Baltimore connection, our principal from Baltimore um, City Public Schools is not available for this call, but we'll make sure um, that we hear from Principal Pinkney at another time, as well as. Um, we had a couple of questions about what to expect. And yes, there will the the chat information and other resources will be available in um, in the follow-up messages from us. So right now, what I'm going to do is ask everyone, all of our panelists, to come back on camera. This is the moment when we're all in here in conversation together um, as um excuse me, as Elizabeth did as she wrapped up her conversation, um, there are tools being used across the country in large urban areas and, and small rural parishes. And what we want to talk about now is how are we deeply engaging with family um, with, with families in order to support math and literacy? Um, I'm going to turn this over to Karen Mapp so that she can facilitate this conversation with our panelists. So thank you. Thanks again. And so I'm very excited that we're going to have a little bit of time to get our panelists to uh, to chat a bit. And so I want to start us off first by thanking all of you, because I know everybody has busy schedules. And so the first question I want to put out there is that, you know, this this particular uh, the first in the series um, that the USDOE is doing in collaboration with the part our partners. And so I, when we, I also want to thank them as well. Um, but I want to ask the the, the panel, uh, this esteemed panel, uh, could you talk a little bit more about, since this is about math, uh, could you talk a little bit more about um, 
how you're equipping, empowering families um, to better support their children in, in math specifically. Anybody want to take that one on? I could start there. Um, thank you, Dr. Mapp. So one thing that we're doing at Family Engagement Lab is continuing to grow our content library with fast talk messages that support high quality instructional materials in math. So getting those messages out via text or the easy ways that families can embed that mathematical learning into their everyday interactions. Um, and I think another piece that's so important when we think about math and literacy really is helping families feel successful about their role in supporting those different academic outcomes. And I think something too we think about, especially with math, is like modeling that positivity towards math. There can be anxiety when we think about new ways of learning math, but how do we help families be really successful around that? And, you know, we want to really connect families with children's whole educational experiences. So that means across those domains, those subject areas. And so that's something that's really important for us at Fast Talk is how do we put that really high quality information into families' hands across those domains? Thanks, Elizabeth. Anybody else want to weigh in on that one? I can chime in briefly. Uh, uh, and Carlin, I saw you come off mute, so I'll hand it to you uh, as well. So Springboard's programming focuses on early literacy. But our method can be applied to any subject area uh, or grade level. Uh, our method for family engagement is goal setting, plain and simple, you know, build a relationship, set a goal, do a lot of practice, measure progress, rinse, repeat. Uh, there's nothing about that, that uh, uh, that's unique to literacy. Uh, and we think that it can uh, move the needle on student outcomes in, in all kinds of ways. Uh, Carlin, what would you add? Well, I would just add that, um, you know, much, much like we're doing for literacy, we are um, kind of as was mentioned by Elizabeth, um, doing workshops, helping uh, families understand, right, you know, how we are supporting math strategy, um, how it's not about, you know, always the right answer, but is a, being able to talk to talk through the problem, you know, apply a strategy. Uh, we're a big um, cognitively guided instruction CGI um, in math district. So um, sometimes we have, you know, sessions for families about doing math at home, counting collections, counting things in the house. Else, right. Um, you know, looking at images and seeing the math there. So it's, you know, making those real world connections to math and, you know, making them feel comfortable. It's OK. You know, your child may not be doing math the way you learned it, um, but that's OK. Right. It's about them, you know, sharing their thinking, um, using their, their strategies and, um, you know, being confident and seeing themselves as mathematicians. But then, you know, of course, uh, you know, bite sized chunks, things that families can practice at home. Um, are also helpful. And then we have an array of digital tools that support math. So we often, um, you know, um, share the digital tool with families and how um, the students are doing personalized practice that way and just encouraging them to get on and practice as a way to help in math. You know, one of the things that I want to lift up here uh, that I hope that our participants today are hearing is that number one, one of the things that we talk about in the framework in terms of uh, best practice and high impact strategies is that we need to link our family engagement practices with learning. Families want to be engaged with us in partnership over their children's learning. And so when we keep them out of that, as, as Alejandro said, it, it's the secret sauce uh, to making sure that we hit our goals. And so that's number one. And number two, I want to lift up the fact that you know, Alejandro, you told a very powerful story about you and your families and sort of these low expectations that unfortunately we still deal with, you know, those mindsets, right? Those deficit-based mindsets. And what I think is powerful about starting off a conversation about math, right, is because for a lot of people, one of the things that we sometimes hear is, oh, well, you know, our families, this is going to be too hard for them, right? So you all have dispelled that myth. And I really, really appreciate that. So let's talk a little bit more about, you know, you know, family engagement is not a new concept, uh, although we, we still have to keep beating the drum to get people to understand that it is, it is an essential ingredient to the success of our students in our schools, uh, you know, but we still are, are battling a little bit to try to get people to accept this and realize it. So um, could you talk about, could one of you talk a little bit about sort of 
Um, you know, what, what have been some of the traditional barriers? I think the mindsets is one, right? But what have been some of the traditional barriers uh, to make the kind of good practice that we're talking about today so difficult? And um, what do you think has happened in the last few years to sort of open up the doors? I think the pandemic has done that, right? I think a lot of people came to realization that we can't do engagement without our families during the during the pandemic. So it was sort of a forcing function. We talk about this in the article that Ial Bergman and I did with Carnegie, um, embracing a new normal. But what do you think were some of the the barriers? But what what do we you, we see as innovation that's happening now to sort of break down those? Anybody want to take that one on? I'm happy to jump in on that. I think um, you know it's definitely um, a, a important role for families that they were playing in the pandemic. But one thing that always struck me, the beginning of the pandemic was why more people weren't asking for parents to share what they were observing at home about their child's learning progress. Even just opening up that question, um, I think still um, such an important, um, you know, uncharted territory, I think for a lot of schools. So, um, uh, however, I think there are a lot of factors that contributed to more innovation. Um, and I'm seeing innovation accelerating specifically in districts and schools and in states where there's much more of a formal recognition of the role of families that is explicit in policies and in the academic strategies. Um, and so when, when, with those kind of hallmarks of a focus on family engagement, specifically tied to learning, um, it also creates more of a, a momentum around internal collaboration within school systems across domains. So family engagement isn't a separate scene as separate from academics and instruction, and similarly, academic instruction isn't seen, isn't seen as separate from family engagement. Um, there, when uh, also states are supporting districts to identify best practices, and there's a confluence across those factors, I think that really helps. But I think there's another area that I wanna highlight that needs much more attention nationally, which is the need for more districts and educators to have access to learning resources for families and particularly learning resources for families that are available in their home language. Um, there's a particularly acute need there and it's a significant equity issue. Um, and so, uh, you know, in order to kind of support that, we definitely need more flexible funding um, and better policies to really drive innovation more in those areas that really need attention. I agree with with everything Vidya uh, shared. I, I think that siloed thinking is starting to, to go away. I remember years ago, I, I would be in a, a district pitch and sometimes the they wouldn't know who to invite. Like, do I invite the head of family engagement? Do I invite the head of teaching and learning? I guess I'll invite both. And sometimes those people would be meeting each other for the for the first time in a, in a springboard pitch. And I, I think we've come a long way to, to realize that that family engagement and student student learning are two sides of the the same coin uh, and the pandemic helped to uh, accelerate that to the point that you made uh, Dr. Mapp. When I think about the, the barriers that continue to be there, two come to mind. Uh, one is around teacher preparation and another is around teacher capacity. Uh, so on the teacher preparation front, I think it's only 17 of 50 states that name families in teacher licensing requirements, which means in every other state, it, it formally ain't a part of the job to know how to work with families and, and so uh, graduate schools of education that are working backwards from those licensing requirements aren't preparing teachers to, to know how do I partner with parents, uh, especially across lines of difference to, to accelerate student learning. So I think that there's important work uh, being done there. Uh, I know NAFSCI, uh, the organization that Dr. Mapp is on the, the board of, is spearheading a lot of that work. Uh, and I think it's really far upstream and, and critical. And then there's also the, the constraint around teacher capacity. Teachers are, are spread thin. Uh, and I think uh, that that's really ripe for innovation uh, and disruption. Uh, so the, the big light bulb moment that I had, we did a focus group uh, and there was a teacher uh, who had done Springboard for many years. And she said, here's how I took everything I learned from programming and, and used it to change my practice as a teacher. Here's what I do. For every parent-teacher conference, I take the most recent assessment that I gave and then I write up a blurb for each family so that they know what that actually means. Something super simple. Is your kid on track? What are their strengths and challenges? What's the one thing you can do at home to support their learning? Uh, then I set a goal for every kid because I know the goal is like the, the most important uh, uh, catalyst. Uh, and then I find resources that are going to be helpful to each family to, to help them reach that goal. We talk about it all at our parent-teacher conferences, and, and then the goal-setting cycle has begun. Again, in between one conference and the next, this teacher would then reach out to families and share resources and, and check in. Next parent-teacher conference, they celebrate all the progress they made, and, and you know they, they set the next goal. 
it was everything that drives impact within Springboard, but just a fundamental part of what it meant for that teacher to teach. Uh, and what what I got excited about was not the fact that like, sure, that teacher was putting forth so much effort that you couldn't reasonably expect the average teacher to, to be able to pull off. However, everything that that teacher was doing outside of the uh, conversation with families at the parent-teacher conference could uh, and arguably should uh, be supported by technology, right? That there's no reason a teacher should have to handwrite family-friendly score reports. We can build tech that translates the classroom assessment into something that's going to be meaningful for parents. There's no reason a teacher should have to manually set a goal for every kid. There, there's no reason teachers should hunt and peck for which resources are going to be most helpful to, to families. Uh, so something that, that Springboard's working on kind of in our innovation lab is how do, can we build that technology to, to just make it frictionless, to make it so that without any marginal effort on the part of the teacher, how can we enable every teacher, your average teacher, to be a, a family engagement rock star? And I think there's there's lots of room to innovate there. You know, and I think this conversation is is leading to the next question, which I'm going to amend a little bit because we've gone in that direction. And, you know, I, I think that the presentations so far have done a really good job, uh, spot on, of lifting up uh, the process conditions in the dual capacity building framework. We've talked about, you know, the I, I remember someone talked about the relational piece, building that relational trust with families. That's the first step. Because if there's no trust, if people don't feel your love, they're not going to lean into any of these strategies or practices. We talk about link to learning. We've talked about seeing families through an asset-based lens, et cetera, et cetera. I think, Alejandro, you both, you and uh, Vidya have moved us into the organizational conditions, the supports that need to be there so that our teachers and others can actually do this family engagement work. We can't just tell them, go forth and engage families, right, and try to, to improve literacy and math without the supports. And that's why my your heart was fluttering, Alejandra, before. Uh, I mine, mine is because Carlin is here, right? She's representing, you know, the district perspective. So can you all talk about, you know, what can states and, and districts uh, do to try to support this work, to try to help our teachers and other educators you know, really have the time uh, and the resources and the capacity to, to do the kind of family engagement practice that we've been talking about today. Any suggestions, any recommendations? I think something that was important for DeSoto Parish was we had curriculums that had um, these, these facets in place, meaning we had um, curriculums with social emotional learning connected. And that was an opportunity to connect that with the teachers and the parents. So uh, providing PD for our teachers, uh, highlighting these different parts was really important for our students, teachers and parents, and then making those connections for families to how they could support that learning in the home. Um, coming from an educator perspective, you don't always think um, or you're not always in the shoes of a parent who might not have had the, all the opportunities surrounding education. So really surveying our communities for what they needed and what they wanted and how we could support them and creating focus groups benefited DeSoto Parish. And we saw a rise following the pandemic, our third to fourth grade cohort in ELA grew 18.9 points. And that was somewhere that we focused a lot of instruction around curriculum and parent support. And that was really powerful for our students, teachers, our parents and our community. Anyone else wanna weigh in on what our districts and yeah. states can do? Well, I was just thinking, um, we, you know, have those structures where we have, you know, parent conferences and it's after school and we, you know, we review the data, we review the progress with parents. Um, but, you know, what we saw from the springboard um, program was to really, you know, there's something called a family huddle. Right, um, that's built into the program. It's a the parent, teacher, student like conversation to start. You know, um, you know that cycle of learning. Um, and I think what we can do, um, you know, as a district, is to really support people of thinking of other ways to bring families in. So it's not just the, you know, the parent conference week. 
you know, it's not just the the workshop, but um, some of the power in, you know, the springboard um, family engagement model is that, you know, families come into the classroom, into the learning time. Um, and so maybe we can make, you know, permission, right, and space and time for that to happen. And then even teachers um, have time to plan, you know, for that, that, those conversations with families. And I think, you know, that's where also we can, you know, provide that planning time in addition to the training, right, letting everybody know that this is so valuable and important, and we make space for this during the instructional time. Right, yeah, that's, moving, that's moving us into that co, that co-creation space. Thank you. So I see the, go ahead, Alejandro. I know that we, tactical thing. I know that the buzz is about to go off, but one yes. really tactical thing that, that would be like my dream uh, uh, for districts is that in any RFP uh, that you put out uh, for learning recovery, uh, whether it's tutoring or otherwise, include uh, a requirement that, that families be engaged uh, as part of that solution, right? Because otherwise, the number of district leaders I talk to that say, I just bought tutoring for uh, uh, every kid and, and no one's showing up. If you're not engaging the family, the, the utilization rate is going to be so low anyway. And if you do engage the family, then you're going to have such a multiplier on, on uh, 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 the intervention because the family is going to take that and run with it and, and provide so much more instructional time in an ongoing way at home. So RFPs, I think, are such a critical lever to ensure that people come to districts with solutions that don't leave the family behind. Right. And I think that what we talked about again in the Carnegie piece is that if family engagement is a priority, we expect it to see it on your on your budget sheet. Right. So so Cecilia, I'm going to Cicely. I know I keep messing up your name today. I apologize. <laughs> it's totally fine. <laughs> Whenever I have too many C's and L's, I always unfortunately get them messed up. But we're going to turn it over to you to uh, direct us for the Q&A period. Awesome. So everyone, all of my panelists, if you if you all can please stay on camera. Um, we have a, a great number of questions in here. I'm going to try to consolidate these down to three. And if we can hopefully get answers to these three, that would be amazing. Um, the first one is really about how the your family engagement um, practices and, and, and approaches are targeting um, specific student populations. We have questions in here about reaching English language learner um, families or uh, families that don't speak English at home. We have questions in here about um, families of different racial ethnic backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds, and um, a few about um, families with students with disabilities. So if you can address um, maybe one or two of a, of a special population group, a targeted population group, and how you've um, addressed family engagement to support student success there, that would be amazing. I'd love to share a, um, a, a really a story that um, yielded a very surprising insight for um, for the district partner we were working with. Um, this is Oakland Unified School District, and um, uh, Elizabeth and I uh, uh, began our work as a pilot in schools um, that had uh, the lowest um, kindergarten literacy scores out of the district. So 11, 11 classrooms where we began our pilot. And we also began to look at, um, you know, how we can provide information for a particular group of families that uh, was was um, uh, reaching a, a very large percentage of the population there. So these are families who uh, had immigrated from uh, Mexico and Guatemala, who spoke mom, and had very limited um, uh, uh, literacy rates within this group. So speaking both about um, the language that is, um, often not reflected or represented in, in, in written materials, but also, um, you know, where the literacy rates were quite low. When we looked at, uh, you know, an experimental analysis, uh, quasi-experimental an analysis of a particular student group whose parents spoke mom at home, that was a group that had the highest growth in uh, literacy outcomes in, uh, in, out of all of the, the students in, in, in the study. Um, what was so surprising about it was because they were receiving text messages in Spanish. And what we found, and then we, we, just did, we, we ran a focus group and tried to understand what was happening. And the parents said, we know we found somebody 
to help us translate this and learn and, and to um, so that I because I was getting something and I my my spouse spoke, uh, read Spanish or friends spoke Spanish. I found somebody to help me and I helped my child. So the resourcefulness of parents, you cannot discount. If you make an effort, they will come meet you where they are as well, where you are, where they are. And it's just even just that effort made such an outsized impact for those students. So um, it's, I think it's a really powerful story to not have a limited mindset about parents themselves, but to make effort, try, do, do, do what you can, do your best, and you'll be surprised. And you can come up with solutions together once you make those steps. I'll piggyback off that because um, I think there's some there's a powerful takeaway here. Uh, we did an externally a, a, an external study, and uh, it also found that the kids who are furthest behind uh, grade level were the ones who made the most progress. Uh, and, and the takeaway to me is that sometimes the people uh, of which we expect the least are, are the ones who are gonna make the most uh, uh, progress and, and and are ready, willing, and able to, to prove us wrong. So I think it, it's a way to, to check our, our expectations. Um, Somebody raised uh, the question of children with learning differences. About a, a third of the kids uh, within our programming have an identified learning distance and difference, and many more uh, have needs that, that have not yet been identified. So our, our perspective is that every kid deserves an individualized education plan, uh, and as part of our programming, uh, we create an individualized goal and learning plan for each kid and family. Uh, and that 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 I think is something that uh, uh, we can embrace. Uh, for every kid, especially uh, those kids that, that do have an identified learning difference. Thank you. I'm going to move us on to the next question. And that is really one that is specific to high school. I think what we hear a lot about is um, improvements or, or, or efforts to really target parents of younger children. We know that um, that, that engagement um, often falls off with um, older older children. And we had several questions about high schoolers. Um, I'm wondering if anyone in the group can speak to um, their approaches with high schoolers and their families. Well, I just want to jump in to say that the research shows that family engagement is, is as important uh, at the level of middle and high school uh, than it is for our pre-K to elementary school students. My colleague, Nancy Hill, has done quite a bit of research on uh, family engagement and its importance for the adolescent. Because don't forget, when we look at youth development, uh, our young people, their brain development is just as active uh, and just as robust when they're in that you know 16 to 24-ish range it is, as it is when they are, are newborns on up to two or three years old. So uh, and, and Nancy will tell you, Dr. Hill will tell you that she's done research in where she's talked to teenagers and they've told her that they feel that family engagement is actually more important uh, at the level of, of high school and, and middle school than at any other time. Now, does it need to look different? Yes. Uh, and so uh, there's, there's, there's quite a bit of uh, information out there on how to sort of augment our strategy so that they are developmentally appropriate for our uh, middle and high school kiddos. So I don't know if people have specific examples of that. Um, I know that I could think of quite a few, but I, I want our panelists to weigh in. We use student-led conferencing. So at our um, all levels of education, it does look different, um, as Dr. Matt was saying, at the middle and high school level. But they are taking those opportunities. The students are, and they are inviting the parents into the classroom, and they are leading the conversation. We build they the students build portfolios out, and so they have talking points and where where they structure um, what they're going to share, what their goal may be, where their prog progress is um, currently and where they need to end up. And then they focus, even at the um, at the lower levels, they even focus on um, the standards and the assignments, which are tied to the different standards and where they are progressing through the curriculum. So we put it in the hands of the student ownership piece um, and giving them the opportunity to showcase both 
their successes and also uh, look at look at things that they could support better and then having a parent commit to something that they could support that student in or a series of events or activities at home. And we provide also activities on our district website to further support that as well. So that's been really powerful and messaging um, through our classrooms to our parents, allowing them the opportunity to ask questions that further support the student instruction at home, focusing uh, we really do live in a growth mindset here. So focusing on that opportunity to showcase those assets and then fine tuning those areas of weakness. And this is the time when our families are really interested in getting information from us about how to support their children, because I don't know how many of you uh, currently have a teenager at home, but I think if you do, you know uh, that sometimes getting information out of them is a little tough. And so consequently, this is a great time for us to be in this partnership with our families. Families in some cases are desperate for information about how their young adolescent is doing and what supports they can provide them. So uh, do not slack off on engagement. And, you know, sometimes we're our own worst enemy in the education space because I know I've heard educators say to me, well, you know, we don't really need the families to be that engaged at the middle and high school. The kids are, we're trying to grow them up and well, we, you need the village still to do that. So not the time to start backing off on engagement with families. Thank you for those insights and thank you panelists. Um, we are down to two minutes left. So I don't know that we have time for this last question, but I'm gonna put it out there in the ether. And if you think that you have an answer for it, if you can put it in the chat, um, it's a simple one. How do we get started? I heard lots of pieces around that. I heard RFPs. I heard in the budget. I heard, um, you know, relationships. There, there's so much from the dual capacity framework. There are so many places I would just love if you, you know, in your expertise, just drop in the chat. How do we get started? Okay. Um, so what I want to do with these last couple of minutes is first thank each and every one of you attendees for joining, for being part of this conversation. Um, this is the first of six conversations that we'll be having. We, we fully appreciate you um, joining and being part of this first one focused on math and literacy. We will be having, excuse me, five more. Uh, the additional conversations here uh, are listed on the screen. Upcoming next month is attendance and student engagement. Um, please join us, you know, same bat channel, same bat station, um, as we talk with a, a, another set of experts and bright spots in the field who are, who are really um, setting awareness around research and strategies for our, our local and state leaders. I also want to thank the panelists for all of your time and attention to this. Um, we actually stood this first webinar up very quickly, and I appreciate your, your, your pace to make this happen. And I appreciate your commitment to the field um, and to parents nationwide, probably globally. So thank you, uh, panelists, for being part of this. And I want to charge as we wrap that we all think about our commitments. You'll see that in the resources that come out. Let's, let's be very intentional about taking these resources and converting them to action. So thank you all and have a great month. And I'll see you back here next month. Bye-bye.